Hello everybody, this is David. Welcome back to my channel. This video is the next in our series, The Christian Ethic in the 21st Century. And we're currently looking at a new system of ethics that was uh, that's trying to supplant the Judeo-Christian ethic that we've been, lo been looking at. And that is situation ethics. And in the last video, we looked at what it was. And in this video, I want to look at um, some situations and aspects, some things, the kind of things that the situationist says um, in their new way of thinking. So if you're ready, let's have a look. But before we start, it has to be said, though, that the situation ethics person does not, as it were, start from nothing. They know all the rules and the principles. They know all that the accumulated experience of humanity has found out. They know that there are rules and principles, but they refuse to say that any principle is absolutely binding and always valid, right or wrong in itself. Now, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a very interesting man, lived in the 1940s and I may well do a video on him at some point. He said this, and I quote, Principles are only tools in the hand of God, soon to be thrown away as unserviceable. End of quote. Now, the situationist does not deny that there are principles. They do not, for a moment, deny the classifications of things that experience, human experience, has built up but they completely refuse to be shackled or bound by anything. So we've got to qualify all of this for to the situationist, there is one thing and one thing only that is absolutely always and universally good. And that one thing is love. As I said, this came right out of the 1960s, and that's definitely 1960s thinking. So Fletcher's first two propositions are only one thing is um, intrinsically good, namely love, nothing else. And the second thing is that the ultimate norm of Christian decisions is love, nothing else. So quite clearly, we will have to be sure of just what love is. The situationist is not talking about what we might call romantic love. Now, in Greek, as I've mentioned in previous videos, um, there are four words for love. There is, it, oh, by the way, Greek again was the, um, the English of the ancient world. So that, that's why I'm mentioning Greek. Everybody spoke it. It was the universal language that everyone spoke. So in Greek, there are four words for love. There is eros, which means passion. And there is always sex in eros. There is philia, which is um, friendship feeling. There is, there is physical love in philia, but there is loyalty and companionship as well. Then there is storge, which is love in the family circle. There's no sex in it. It is the love of a father for a daughter, a son for his mother, a brother for a sister. And then there is agape. This is the word. Agape is unconquerable goodwill. It is the determination always to seek the other person's highest good no matter what they do to you. Insult, injury, indifference, it does not matter. Nothing but goodwill. Now, it has been defined as purpose, not passion. It is an attitude to the other person. Now, this is important because we, if we talk about this kind of love, it means that we can love the person we don't like. It's not a reaction of the heart. It is an attitude of the will and the whole personality direct, deliberately 
directed to the other person. So you cannot order a person to fall in love in the romantic sense of the term. Falling in love is like stepping on a banana skin. It happens and that's all there is to it. But you can say to a person, your attitude to others must be such that you will never, never, never want anything but their highest good. Now, obviously, when we define love like this, love is a highly intelligent thing. So we must, in any situation, work out what love is. What does love demand? Now, this is where we're going to get into some of the uh, the situationist ethics. Their 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 um, propositions, for example, or their their pictures or their circumstances. Let's say, for instance, a house catches fire, and in it there is a baby and the original of the Mona Lisa, the famous painting. Which one do you save, the baby? or the priceless and irreplaceable picture. Well, there's really no problem here. You save the baby for a life is always of greater value than a picture. But what about this then? Suppose in the burning house there is your elderly father, an old man with the days of his usefulness at an end and a doctor who has discovered a cure for one of the world's great killer diseases and he hasn't written it down yet, it's still in his head. You can save only one. Who do you save? Your father, who is dear to you, or the doctor in whose hands there are thousands of lives, which is love. What about this one then? And this is a, quite a, a common story um, in these circles. Now on the Wilderness Trail uh, in America in uh, previous centuries, Daniel's, Daniel Boone's trail westward um, through Cumberland Gap to Kentucky, on that trail there were many families in the trail caravans lost their lives to the Indians. Now, there's two, there's two things that they bring up here. A Scottish woman had a baby at her breast. The baby was ill and crying. And the baby's crying was betraying her other three children and the rest of the party. The party could clearly not remain hidden if the baby continued crying. Their position would be given away. Well, the mother clung to the baby and the baby's cries led the Indians to the position and the party was discovered and all were massacred. So there was another such occasion. On this occasion, there was a black woman in the party. Her baby too was crying and threatening to betray the party. She strangled the baby with her own two hands to stop its crying and the whole party escaped. Which action was love? The action of the mother who kept her baby and brought death to it and to herself and to all, or the action of the mother who killed the baby and saved the lives of the caravan. Now here is the kind of decision with which the situationist confronts us. Which action was love? Now the situationist is always confronting us with decisions. There is no absolute right or wrong. We have to work it out in each situation. There are principles, of course, but they can only advise. They do not have the right of veto. They cannot overrule. Any principle must be abandoned, left disregarded, if the command to love your neighbour can be better served by so doing. The situationist is sure that a rigid sticking to the rules is all wrong. It can produce what someone, this is what they say, it can produce what someone called the immorality of morality. It can produce what Mark Twain called, and I quote, a good man in the worst sense of the term, end of quote. And a French 
priest said that fan fanatic love of virtue has done more harm than all the vices put together. It is the situation that counts. There are times when justice can become unjust. So Fletcher tells two stories, the first from real life and the second from a play. Now a friend of Fletcher's arrived in St. Louis just as a presidential campaign was ending. He took a cab and the cab driver volunteered the information. I and my father and my grandfathers and their fathers have always been straight ticket Republicans. Ah, said Fletcher's friend, who is himself a Republican, I take it that means you will vote for Senator so-and-so. No, said the driver, there are times when a man has to push his principles aside and do the right thing. There are times when principles become wrong, even when they are right. So the other story is from a play called The Rainmaker. The Rainmaker, who's the main character, makes love to a spinster girl in a barn at midnight. He does not really love her, but he is determined to save her from becoming spinsterized. He, he wants to give her back her womanhood and to rekindle her hopes of marriage and children. Her morally outraged brothers threatens to shoot him. Her father, a wise old rancher, says to his son, Son, you're so full of what's right that you can't see what's good. So for the situationist, a thing that is labelled wrong can, in certain circumstances, be the only right thing. So this leads us to the second of Fletcher's basic principles, which is love and justice are the same thing. For justice is love distributed, nothing else. We can relate love and justice in different ways. Sometimes people think of love versus justice, as if love and justice were against each other, or love or justice, as if you had to choose one or the other, but you could not have both, or love and justice, as if the two things complemented each other. But for Fletcher, love is justice. Love and justice are one and the same thing. Now, this is a new idea. Um, the neighbour, who was a great American teacher, used to say that the difference is that love is transcendent and love is impossible. While justice is something by which we can live in this present society. Brunner held that the difference is that love must be between two persons whereas justice exists between groups. But Fletcher will say it, that love is the same thing as justice. Now, how does he, how does he get, get to this point? Now, accept the fact that the one absolute is love, then love has to be worked out in the situations of life. And the working out of it is justice. Justice, it is said, consists of giving each man his due. But the one thing that is due to every man is love. Therefore, love and justice are the same. Justice, says Fletcher, is love distributed. When we are confronted with the claims of more than one person or three or four people, we have to give them love. And it is justice which settles just how love is to be applied to each of them. Justice is love working out its problems. So then, unless love is to be a vague, sentimental, generalised feeling, there must be justice, because justice is love applied to particular cases. This is precisely what is so often the matter with love, the fact that it never gets worked out and never gets beyond a feeling or an emotional. For example, Fletcher cited the case of Sammy Davis Jr. Bear in mind, this is the 1960s. 
Sammy Davis Jr., the great entertainer, became a Jew. He was a black man who became a Jew and thereby repudiated Christianity. And this is what he said. As I see it, the difference is that the Christian religion preaches love thy neighbour and the Jewish religion preaches justice. And I think that justice is the big thing we need. End of quote. 1960s thinking. Sammy Davis was black, as I said, and he knew all about so-called Christian love. As Fletcher said, there are many people who would claim that they love black people and who at the same time deny them simple justice. Fletcher goes on to paraphrase the classic cry of protest. We can say to hell with your love. We want justice. This is exactly what happens when justice and love are not equated. This is right out of the 1960s. Uh, and of course, right down to the present day too. This means that love has always got to be thinking. Love has always got to be calculating. Otherwise, love is like the bride who wanted to ignore all the recipes and simply let her love for her husband guide her when she was baking him a cake. Love has to think wisely, deeply, intelligently. Fletcher goes on to illustrate the kind of problem love must face and solve. Now take the case of a nurse in a TV, TV play called The Bitter Choice. She was in charge of a ward in a military hospital for wounded soldiers and she acted with deliberate and calculated severity and even harshness to make the wounded soldiers hate her so much that the one thing they wanted was to get out on their feet and get out. Was this cruelty or was it a far more real love than the love which coddled and comforted until the men had no wish to leave the hospital at all? What about this one then? Take the case of a doctor. Now a doctor is bound not to divulge any of the affairs of his patients. In his Hippocratic Oath, he promises, and I quote, whatever in my professional practice, or even not in connection with it, I see or hear in the lives of men which ought not to be spoken of abroad, I will not divulge deeming on that on such matters we should be silent, end of quote. So that this doctor knows that a marriage is going to take place. He knows both parties. He knows that the girl is a virgin and is pure. He happens to know that the boy has been a playboy and has syphilis. What is the duty of love? Does the do doctor keep his oath? If a doctor began to talk, it would create a situation that would be intolerable. It, or does he tell the girl, which is love? What about this one then? Fletcher quotes a war incident which happened in Italy. A priest in the underground movement bombed and destroyed a Nazi freight train. The occupying Germans then began killing 20 prisoners a day and said they would go on doing so until the saboteur was handed over or surrendered. The priest refused to give himself up, not because he contemplated more, more sabotage, but because, so he said, there was no other priest available in the district and the people needed the absolution he could give for their soul's sake. Now you have to ask the question, what's a priest doing blowing things up? Anyway, after three days, a fellow resistance fighter deliberately betrayed the priest in order to stop the massacre of prisoners. Was he right? Was what looked like an act of treachery, in fact, an act of love? Love has got to calculate. And it may well be that love has to use methods which in other circumstances would be terrible things. 
the argument of the situationist is nothing is that nothing is absolutely good or bad it all depends on the situation and in certain situations even an act of treachery may be an act of love so let us return to the ten commandments for example the situation this knows the ten commandments he respects them he does not just throw them aside but he is prepared to say that there can come times when any of the ten commandments may become a bad thing and when it may be a christian duty to break any or all of them i'm going to leave the video here for that but for now and uh, there's many many more examples that fletcher quotes i'm sure you've had enough by now um, and in the next video, we're going to have a look at how we're going to answer situation ethics and any other type of uh, ethics of morality that comes against the Judeo-Christian ethics. I want to thank you for joining me in this video. I'll see you on the next one. Bye bye.